Good morning, friends. Welcome to our Blue Water Church service online. We're so pleased that you could join us. If you happen to be watching the premiere at 9.45 Sunday morning on February the 14th, then go ahead and say hi in the live chat section. We'd love to connect with you there. And of course, if you're watching some other time during the week, we're so glad that you could join us wherever you're watching from today. This morning, we're continuing our current teaching series called Daring Greatly. And in that, we are looking at what it means for us to not just sit on the bleachers and watch other people do what we think of as, as church ministry or kingdom building work, but what does it look like for us to actually jump into the game and become kingdom activists ourselves and together as a church family? So that's what we're continuing this morning. If you have your Bible nearby, you can open to Luke chapter 11. You may even have a bookmark in there from last Sunday. We've spent the last couple Sundays in Luke chapter 11. So you can turn there and Chris is going to be referring um, to a passage in that chapter a little bit later. This morning, our call to worship reading comes from the Psalms again. We've been spending a few Sundays with our call to worship reading coming from the Psalms. And today's Psalm celebrates who God is and also who we are as his people, dearly loved by him. And our friend Elaine is going to read that Psalm for us now. Good morning, church family from Sunny Kincardine. Today we're reading from Psalm 100 a psalm of thanksgiving. Shout with joy to the Lord, O earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. That was so lovely. Thank you, Elaine. Nathan is going to lead us in a new song, or at least new for us in just a moment. But first, would you pray with me? Good morning, Jesus. We're here together to worship you with gladness. We agree with the psalmist who said that you are good and your love endures forever. You truly are good. And from your goodness, you created us. You made us to live lives saturated with your love. And we just ask that whatever things in our lives that might be blocking us from receiving your love, things like shame or lies that we may be believing, we just we invite your spirit, Lord, to remove and to dismantle those things at your pace and in your timing. We bring our hearts and our minds to you today, ready and waiting for you to meet us here and to speak to us. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Here's Nathan. Hi, church family. Well, it's Valentine's Day, and uh, to some of us, maybe to me too, it's a little bit of a hallmark holiday. But this year, I wanted to focus on love, but specifically the love that God has for us. And so I wanted to sing this song with you. Um, it's called Loved By You. And uh, just I, I want to go over the first verse. It says, river flow from your throne, from your heart, through my soul, healing flood, God of peace speak your word and quiet me now i like to listen to that kind of while i'm driving and just let the words kind of wash over me and uh the course kind of kicks in there and it just repeats i was made to be loved by you i was made to be loved by you jesus and so uh yeah it's kind of a special song to me and i just wanted to share it with you this morning um you can sing along or maybe just listen, and uh, maybe it will speak to you. Where 
river flow from your throne, from your heart, through my soul, healing flood, God of peace, speak your word. I was made to be loved by you, to be loved by you, to be loved by you, Jesus. I was made to be loved by you, to be loved by you, to be loved by you, Jesus.
transformation is a word that we use quite a bit around blue water. We talk about it a lot with regard to our moorings, our small groups. And we say that we don't want to settle merely for information, we want transformation. Transformation from the inside out. And that is the theme that Jesus is addressing in the passage of scripture that we're going to look at today. It's in Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse 37. And uh, this is what we read. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. Okay, so no big surprise there. We follow Jesus through the Gospels. We know that he went everywhere he was invited and he would eat with anyone, prostitutes, tax collectors, uh, and here a Pharisee. Verse 38, but the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Imagine in a pandemic, uh, we sit down to eat with somebody who hasn't washed. We'd be like, ah, and... Um, because we're worried about uh, virus and germs and so on. Well, that wasn't the uh, issue in the first century. In fact, that's not why they washed before a meal at all. Uh, this was a ceremonial cleansing that is um, kind of the subject here. And of course, this is a Jewish religious expert and uh, Jesus as a Jewish person. Um, there was a, a, a rule, a Jewish religious rule uh, about ceremonial uh, washing. And so before you eat, you not only wash your hands, but you'd wash the cup, you'd wash the utensils, and of course you'd wash your hands. Kind of a consecration of sort for the meal to God. And uh, so anyway, Jesus doesn't do it. And this Pharisee is like, wow, uh, shocked that Jesus doesn't follow this rule. And it's not like Jesus has forgotten it. He doesn't do it intentionally because he wants to uh, provoke a conversation. He wants to get a point across to this Pharisee. And so as soon as Jesus sees the surprise in uh, the Pharisee, he goes on to say in verse 39, Now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? And the um, answer is yes, God made the outside, so don't ignore the outside, and God makes the inside, so don't ignore the inside. Verse 41, but now as for what is inside you, Mr. Pharisee, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you, outside and inside. That's a really interesting statement. And so really, kind of the question that we want to address uh, is this. How do we get clean on the inside? How do we get clean on the inside? And um, this is a really important issue um, because I think that if we're, if we're really, really uh, honest about this, we would probably agree that we're not quite as clean on the inside as we appear to be on the outside. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's monitors that will measure brain activity. There's monitors that will measure uh, heart uh, rhythms and so on. Imagine if there was a monitor that we could hook up to your soul. Uh, the word soul, as we see it in the New Testament, is the Greek word suke. We get psychological from it. So really your soul is your psychology, your intellect, your emotion, your will. It's your thinker, your feeler, your chooser. Imagine if we could hook up something to your soul and then display it on a big screen like a video so we could watch in detail what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what your attitudes really are. And so imagine if we had that and I said to you, hey, would you volunteer um, to wear this device so that on a Sunday morning, instead of our online church, we'll just watch your soul. We'll see in detail your thoughts and your feelings and your attitudes and so on. I, you would probably say no. I don't think we'd get anybody to volunteer for that. I know uh, I certainly wouldn't. And the reason why, uh, again, if we're you know honest about this, um, in, inside um, we sometimes have some animosity. We sometimes have some jealousy. We sometimes have hatred or bitterness or 
sometimes some violent thoughts, sometimes lustful thoughts. And um, again, if it comes right down to it, I think we would probably admit that a lot of what goes on in our soul, our thinker, feeler, chooser, is a lot more egocentric and a lot less spiritual than we sort of let on in our outward behavior. And so the question is, you know, we're in this series that we're calling Daring Greatly. Well, what kind of great dare do I need to engage in in order to really get clean on the inside? And so what we want to do is uh, we're going to look at three strategies. The first two strategies are wrong strategies for getting clean on the inside. And the third strategy, uh, well, it's the right one. We'll just call it the kingdom strategy. Uh, so two wrongs and then a right. So strategy number one, which again is a wrong strategy, is something I call the B&B &B strategy, where B&B &B stands not for bed and breakfast, but it stands for behavior and belief, behavior and belief. Uh, if you wanted to call it a, a different name, you could call it uh, the religious strategy, you could call it the Pharisee strategy, you could call it uh, the performance strategy. And the strategy basically focuses on external things. And it trusts that if you do the external things, then you will be clean on the inside. Kind of a Pharisee mindset, a legalistic mindset, a performance mindset. It's a mindset of, a, of an externally focused religion. If I just wash the cup correctly, if I just wash the utensils and my hands correctly, uh, well, then I'm right with God and then I'm clean. And of course, uh, this, you know, there are all kinds of nuances of this um, strategy existing today in all kinds of religious circles. And so in a lot of religious circles today, you're taught that if you just do the rules, uh, you're going to be okay. That uh, you know, the way to get right with God, the way to be loved by God, the way to get saved by God is just to, to do the behaviors. And if you just, if you just tithe, then you're going to be okay. If you just read your Bible a certain amount, then you're going to be okay. If you just pray a certain amount, you're going to be okay. If you just witness a certain amount, you're going to be okay. Um, if you, um, you know, if you stay away from restricted movies, you're going to be okay. And if you stay away from uh, drinking and smoking, then you're going to be okay. Uh, in other words, just give me the list, right? Just give me the list. Just write it down. Give it to me so I can check off the things to do and check off that I haven't done the things that I'm not supposed to do. And if I do the do's and if I don't do the don'ts, then um, I just do that behavior and then I can just kind of trust that I'm clean. Um, so that's kind of the, you know, that's sort of the behavior component of the BNB, &B, the behavior. But then there's also the belief kind of thing. And some religious circles lean a bit more that way to the, to the belief end or to the doctrine end of things. And their thing is if you just believe the right information, well, then you can know that you're okay if you just have the right views. If you just have the right view of, of uh, inspiration, if you have the right view of eschatology, if you have the right view of baptism, if you have the right view of, of tongues, if you have the right view of Genesis chapter 1, uh, if, you know, if, you've, if you dot all the I's in just the right way and cross all the T's in just the right way, well, then you can know that you're, you're, uh, you're good, you're going to go to heaven, you can know that you're clean, that you're right with God, and so on. And so this B and B strategy, this behavior and belief, just do the right things, don't do the wrong things, believe the right information. Um, it's a very popular strategy. It's been popular for a long time and it's very popular still today. Uh, this, is, this is the strategy that I grew up in. Uh, so I know it quite well. And there are some advantages to it, to be honest. Uh, for one thing, it's a strategy that can make you feel um, really secure because this strategy is very achievable. It's very uh, doable. It's, it's rather concrete. Um, just write it down on paper. I do these things. I don't do these things. I believe this information. And um, yeah, I can check off all those boxes. And so uh, legalistic 
performance-based religion is very tangible and, and it does provide people a, a sense of security because there's a list of things to do, to not do, a list of things, uh, kind of like passing a theology quiz. Um, and I can measure myself against the things on that list and um, I can feel okay about that and it can give me a sense of security. There's another advantage uh, to that B and B behavior and belief strategy. And it's that if I, if I just do the right things and don't do the wrong things and believe the right information, then I don't need to worry about all the, the, um, the grungy, crusty stuff that's deep inside of me. All that stuff that I don't want you to see on, on the big screen when I'm hooked up to that soul monitor, all of that stuff that I'd be horrified for you to see. Well, as long as you don't see it, I'm kind of okay with it. And if I just do the do's and don't do the don'ts, and if I just believe the right information, I don't even need to worry about it. I don't need to look uh, way down deep in there because in this system, you're actually conditioned to not look at it. You're actually conditioned to look on the, uh, on the externals. In fact, uh, dirty little secret, I suppose, the people who tend to succeed the most in this um, strategy, this B and B strategy, and I, I, um, I did really well in this strategy. The people who tend to do really well with it tend to be the people who are the most shallow, and who tend to be the least introspective. Those tend to be the people who do best, who achieve the most, and who rise in leadership. Uh, but if you're an introspective person at all, well, you fairly quickly see through the facade of this external religion. But it's uh, super popular today, and it's been popular uh, really throughout history. Now, there are some problems uh, with this B&B &B, uh, behavior and belief strategy. Uh, for one thing, the B&B &B strategy presupposes a B&B and &B God. It presupposes a God who is more interested in your behavior and in your beliefs than he is in you. Uh, so this strategy says that if I just do the right things and I've got the, uh, you know, the right behavior attached to me and if I've got the, the, I'm believing the right info and I've got that attached to me, then I'm going to be okay. But if I don't have the, the, the right info and the right behavior attached to me, then I'm, I'm out. I'm not going to be okay. And so this is a, this is a, a God who relates on the basis of belief and behavior. And I would suggest to you that that is a sub-Christian view of God. Um, if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. That's, that is the singular and central place from which to get our identity of God. Uh, we look at Jesus. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, John 1 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Elsewhere, the scripture says, no one has seen God at any time, but the one and only son who is himself God and comes from the bosom of the father, he has made him known. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. Don't go running back to Moses or to uh, David or to Joshua and say, what is God really like? No, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus, particularly Jesus at Calvary. That is how you uh, form your uh, sense, your um, idea of God. And so think about Jesus in his public ministry. He did not relate to people merely on the basis of behavior and beliefs. He didn't condition his relationships that way. In fact, what we find is that he tended to aggravate the people who had the right beliefs and behaviors, like the guy he's having lunch with in Luke chapter 11, um, the Pharisees who had all the right behaviors and all, you know, checked off all the right belief boxes. Jesus aggravated them. He tended to kind of repel them, but he attracted people who had all the wrong behaviors and all the wrong beliefs. Think about Jesus when he was dying on the cross. And of course, we know that there were two criminals being 
uh, crucified with him. And one of the criminals has this last minute uh, change of heart and says to Jesus, can I be with you today in paradise? And what does Jesus do? He says, uh, does he say, oh, well, let me think about it. Do you smoke? Can you pass this theology quiz? No, of course he, you know, he doesn't do that. You know, this, this uh, thief, he's about to die, as is Jesus. This is the 11th hour. This is not just the 11th hour of their lives. This is like the 11th hour and 59th minute. Um, and this guy's heart turns. And it's because his heart turns that he is uh, salvageable to God. This guy didn't have right behaviors. He couldn't pass the theology quiz, but it was about his heart turning to Jesus. And so that makes him salvageable. And God is the kind of God who will salvage anybody uh, who can be salvaged. So this, this B and B, this behavior and belief kind of strategy um, presupposes a God who is, uh, who relates to you on the basis of behavior and belief. I would suggest that's a sub-Christian view of God. A second problem with this strategy is that it really doesn't, um, it really doesn't minister life to a person at the innermost part of their being. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it to the full. This B and B strategy does not provide life to the full. In fact, it leaves you feeling rather empty. Things that you can check off on a piece of paper do not bring fullness of joy. Uh, in fact, it leaves you feeling quite empty. And the reason why it leaves you feeling empty is you and I have been created to experience unconditional love in the innermost part of our being and unconditional acceptance and unconditional worth and unconditional significance. And it is God and God alone who provides that fully. But if we are trying to get that love and get that significance and get that value by the things that we do and by the rightness of our beliefs, well, then it's not getting to the innermost part of our being. It's not us that's being valued. It's the things we're doing and it's the, it's the information that we're believing, but it's not us. And so this strategy does not get uh, really to where it needs to in the innermost part of our being. It just leaves you feeling empty. And, and so long as a person remains under this delusion that the way to get unconditional love and the way to get unconditional worth and unconditional acceptance and significance is by the things that we do and the, and the rightness of, of the information that we believe, then if, if, we're, if we're still in that delusion, when we feel empty, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna try harder. We're gonna try and do better. Uh, we're going to try and believe better and do uh, uh, better. And, um, you know, you can, you can pull that lever all day long and it is never, ever going to pay off. It will leave you feeling empty. And so this uh, B&B strategy, um, you know, it's a, it's a sub-Christian view of God. It doesn't bring life to the innermost part of our being. And, and a third problem with this B and B strategy is uh, because it doesn't get to the innermost part of our being and minister life, it can never bring transformation from the inside out. This B and B strategy of belief and uh, behavior, it actually conceals sin. It hides sin and it conceals wounds. Uh, it can never heal wounds and it can never uh, deal with sin. And many of you, uh, or some of you, perhaps if you've either grown up in, in, a, in, a, in a religious environment like this, or if you've uh, experienced it at some point in your life, um, you will know that this system uh, tends to aggravate wounds and it tends to agitate sin. Like if you think logically, if you are in a religious system that gives you points for the way you look, then you are therefore by definition in a religious system that gives you points for hiding your sin and hiding your wounds. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the people who tend to um, fare the best in this system tend to be the people who are the most shallow and the least introspective. And they're also 
the ones who tend to be the best at hiding and the ones who tend to be the best at faking. This is a system that rewards hiding. But the trouble is when wounds are concealed, they fester. And when sin is hidden and concealed, well, these wounds and this sin, well, they end up coming out in, in, in dysfunctional and, and damaging ways. But even if they don't, um, if you are really good, if you're really, really good at the system, you'll find new ways to hide and new ways to conceal. But the thing is, um, inside of this system, if you, if you can just, if you can just take a person like I was in this system and just peel back the veneer of religiosity, this thin veneer, what you, what you find um, are people who are profoundly sick and who are really in bondage to all kinds of sin. It's just beneath the surface. It's hidden, it's concealed. And um, you know, in this system, there are, there's kind of no talk rules, right? And so people in this system will feel like they're the only one who doesn't have it together on the inside. Everybody else does. Everybody else has got this figured out and they're just, you know, they're nailing it outside and inside. But for me, I've got something wrong on the inside. I'm failing at this system, but there's a no talk rule. So that person actually doesn't know that everybody feels like that inside of this system, but we don't talk about it. When I was nine, uh, my brother Mike was killed instantly in a car accident. He was 17 <clears throat> at the time. He was my hero. And, uh, you know, growing up in this kind of a system, never talked about it. And I grew up for years feeling like I'd been screwed over by God, feeling like God was not trustworthy. Deep down hating God. Can you imagine becoming a young pastor who actually hates God? <laughs> imagine what a difficulty uh, that uh, brings with it. So this, this strategy, well, it's, it's uh, about secrecy and hiding. And, and of course, it just gets worse and worse and worse. It doesn't transform a person from the inside out. So how do you get clean on the inside? Well, it's not this B and B strategy. It's not just by making sure that you wash the cup just the right way and the utensils just the right way and, and your hands just the right way. No, this, this strategy will not make you clean on the inside. And so um, an external focus is not the right solution. And secondly, um, ignoring the externals is not a solution either. In other words, having no concern for the cup or the dish or the hands is also not a solution. And I say this because there are some people who actually get freed from the legalistic, um, pharisaical, externally focused performance kind of religion thing. They get freed from that, which is great, um, but then they go to an opposite extreme and they can kind of think this way. Well, you know, I'm saved by grace and since I'm saved by grace. It doesn't matter whether I wash the cup and wash the utensils and, and wash my hands. It doesn't matter whether I do anything externally because I'm saved by grace. And by the way, they always distort uh, what grace really is. Uh, they would say that I'm, I'm loved just the way I am. And therefore, it doesn't matter what I do because God accepts me just the way that I am. And God's, um, I am uh, in no way conditioned uh, to be accepted by God on the basis of my behavior, about my beliefs. He accepts me just like I am. And uh, not only that, but when God looks at me, he sees me in Jesus. Um, God sees me through a Jesus lens. And so it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter that I don't care about the poor. It doesn't matter that I, I, I spend 98 point uh, 3% of my income on myself, which is the average, uh, uh, professing uh, Christians uh, rate of, of giving. It doesn't matter uh, because God looks at me in Jesus. God looks at me through, a, through Jesus lens. And uh, because of that, I'm clean um, without any concern whatsoever for the exterior, for the outside. 
Does it matter that I don't seek after God? Does it matter that I really don't care about his word? Does it matter that I really don't feel convicted about anything? I just pretty much do whatever I want because God looks at me in Jesus. And so it doesn't matter about my external behavior. I'm saved by grace. Um, this idea that getting clean on the inside has nothing to do with the exterior is just as mistaken and off base as to think that I can get clean on the inside by focusing on the exterior. Both are equally wrong. Look again at verse 41 of Luke chapter 11. But now, Jesus says, but now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Be generous to the poor. That's, that's, that's a behavior, right? You see that? So clearly Jesus isn't somehow separating inside from outside. He's not divorcing uh, the external from the internal. We don't see him doing that at all throughout the gospels. Um, in fact, <clears throat> if you look back to uh, Luke chapter six, <clears throat> verse 43, it says, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. And the point that Jesus is making is, is this. If you are truly a fig tree, you are going to begin, maybe, maybe slowly, uh, but you're going to begin to produce figs and not thorns. Uh, if if the kingdom of God is really alive inside of you, uh, then, and, and you're really becoming that kingdom person, you're going to manifest that. There's, you're going to manifest evidence uh, that that is happening. If you've got the Holy Spirit residing in you, you are going to begin, maybe slowly, but you're going to begin to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, there's going to be signs of life. If you're really alive to God, if you're really a child of God, if the living Christ is in you, if you've been saved and made a new creation in him, there will be signs of life. Absolutely, there will be. It's just like if you're alive biologically, there are signs of life. So if somebody, maybe they're very, very, very sick and just kind of barely alive, but there's still going to be some kind of a heartbeat. There's still going to be some kind of breath. There's going to be some kind of brain activity going on. But if there's no heartbeat and no breath and no brain activity whatsoever, uh, you got to come to the conclusion that they are dead. And so Jesus says, if you're really a fig tree, you're going to begin to bring forth kingdom fruit, kingdom fig fruit. Uh, it can't be any other way. And so when there's been real transformation on the inside, it it has real implications for the outside. Uh, James is a great book to look at uh, along this theme. Uh, let me read from James chapter two and verse 16. If one of you says to them, and in context, the them is referring to the poor and the hungry. So if one of you says to the poor and to the hungry, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So James isn't saying that your action produces brownie points um, with God. But what he says is that faith, if it's not manifested in action, it's a dead faith. He goes on, verse 19, you believe that there is one God. Good. Good for you. That's great. Even the demons believe that and shudder. And so in this series, we're talking about, well, what does it mean to go from mere belief to active faith, to becoming an activist in the kingdom, becoming active in the kingdom life? And James here, this is a very powerful and definitive statement that he makes. Uh, he, he says, you know, you can believe that there's just one God and that's great and that's wonderful and that's true. But if that doesn't have any implications as to how you do life, well, then it does you absolutely no good. He says even the demons believe that. You want to know who has excellent theology and who can get a hundred on a theology quiz? It's Satan. And the demons have excellent theology, but it doesn't translate into a life that is transformed. And so you can have all the right beliefs. 
you can have all the right doctrines, but if it's not translating into a changed life, it does you no good. It does you no good. It would be no different to have all the wrong beliefs, right? It's the same, it's the same result. And so faith that is alive, faith that is genuine, uh, just naturally brings you into kingdom life and it, and it, it, um, it evidences its, itself in a changed life. Now, um, we're, we're running out of time here. Let me, let me just say one more thing to you, uh, to my fellow um, B and B uh, strategy people, um, formerly so. One thing that can happen is uh, you can you can become kind of trained in that system, um, like this. For instance, you might listen to this talk today and go, "Okay, Jesus says that I need to be generous to the poor." And now James says the very same thing. I need to be generous to the poor. Okay, so that's the rule. That's the rule. So I can write that down, be generous to the poor. Um, and thinking that if I do that, uh, then I'll be clean, I'll be okay. Well the, well, the truth is, you can be generous to the poor and full of wickedness. You, you can be generous to the poor and full of self-righteousness. You can be incredibly generous to the poor and full of pride. You can be incredibly generous to the poor and um, full of lust and full of, of uh, judgmentalism. You can't make yourself clean by focusing on the outside. And it doesn't matter what the outside behavior is, even if it's something as good as being generous to the poor. If you're doing it as a way of getting clean, it doesn't work. So, uh, what have we kind of talked about today? Well, we've talked about the fact that um, one wrong way to try and get clean on the inside is by way of our behavior and by way of the rightness of the information that we believe. That doesn't work. We've also said that we can't get clean on the inside by ignoring the outside either. Well, that really brings us to the third way, what we want to call the, the kingdom way, the right way. And it is exactly where we'll start uh, next time. God bless. Thanks so much, Chris. And thanks again, Elaine, for reading our scripture reading this morning and to Nathan for leading us in a time of musical worship. Next week, we're going to pick up again, continuing this Daring Greatly series, and we're also going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together during our online service coming up next Sunday. Um, in the meantime, go forth knowing that you are seen, you are accepted, and you are loved. Let's sing one more song together as we close this morning's service.
can't hide.